I don't know about you, but I, I love to read the stories of uh, great people, men and women, people that have made their mark in history. But the greatest of all of the people that you'll ever read about is found here in the Word of God. And uh, in my opinion, one of those is found over here in the book of Joshua, chapter number 14. I'm going to read about a man by the name of Caleb this morning. Caleb reminds us of the importance of and the power of patience and the value of vision. It reminds us of the conquest of being courageous and the fruit of having faith in God. And the sad thing is that so many people today are just content with less, living with less than, uh, less than what they could have. And I'm not talking about material things when I say that. Content with living with less than the best. You know, one of the saddest sights that I see is people that have no sense of purpose. What if someone just on the street stopped you out of the blue and said, what is your purpose in life? Why are you here? What is it that you're striving for? Uh, well, a lot of folks might have an answer, but it surely wouldn't be a scriptural answer. But there are some folks that have no real sense of purpose. They just uh, kind of drift through life. There are those that realize no mission in life. They have no vision. They have no goals. They have no, uh, no plans, no expectations. They just, uh, just exist day after day after day. The truth is, till we perceive and till we pursue our God-given purpose, we'll never find peace, joy, and all of those things that satisfies the longing of our heart. But today, as we look at this man by the name of Caleb, we find here a man who's 85 and still making plans. 85 and still making plans. I wish I had time to just read the entire chapter. It starts out by talking about the fact that these are the countries which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan. Now, oh, there's a lot of things that could be said before you ever read that verse, right? We go all the way back to Egypt and think of God delivering them out of Egypt. And we think about all of those years wandering around in the wilderness. And finally, finally, at long last, uh, uh, they're in the land of Canaan. And it's dealing with the inheritance of the, of the different tribes, and it said, by lot was the inheritance as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and for, and for the half tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and a half on the other side of Jordan. I, you know, I have any idea how hard it is for me not to stop there and talk about that. I've got a sermon on that. They settled on the wrong side of Jordan. They were the first to go into captivity, by the way, whenever everything fell apart. They stopped over there. The others went on into the land of Canaan. And the Levites, were given, he didn't give any, but any inheritance because the Levites were representative of the entire nation. Verse 5, as the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did. And they divided the land, and then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord." 
And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. As He said, the, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake the word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now, therefore, and I pause for a reason, now, therefore, because of all that he has just said, and I hope you paid attention now, therefore, God had made a promise. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. The first thing I want you to, to consider this morning is his unending craving. All of this time, he's been longing for that land. All of this time, there was a special spot in that land that he had been promised that he wanted. Fifty-some years ago, I met a man by the name of Bill Harvey, and I heard him sing, and I mentioned that because Bill Harvey wrote a song called, I Want That Mountain. Before the service, I was thinking to myself, there's probably nobody here that's ever heard that other than Scott. And sure enough, Scott used to sing that as a kid in a Christian school. Bill Harvey followed John R. Rice from meeting to meeting. I've got all of the verses here, and I wish I had time to read all of them. They're all great. But I love the little chorus. It says, I want that mountain. I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flows, where the grapes of Esco grow, I want that mountain. I want that mountain, that mountain that my Lord has given me. You ever thought about what you desire out of life? Have you ever thought about what you really want out of life? Here's a man that had been promised by God that I, I'm going to give you that mountain. And all of these years, he has longed for that. And he refused to give up. By the way, that's typical of people who want to, ex to experience the fullness of God's blessings. They don't give up. So many people do some little something will happen and they just throw in the towel. So many times something, isn't it amazing to you that somebody says, yes, I, boy, I'm a member of my church and I know we're not perfect and what have you, but I'm a member of this church and boy, I'm going to stick it out. And, uh, da, da, da. and the first time some little something doesn't go their way, they hit the trail. That amazes me. What if we had the same attitude about our families? First time your kid messes up, disown him, kick him out the door. First time your wife doesn't please you, uh, hit the road. And it's amazing that so many times we have such little regard for the Lord's church and our commitment to it. People just give up too easy. That's typical of, of people that end up losing out. Here's a man that wanted to serve God. He wanted what God wanted for him. That unending craving in him, day after day after day, over and over, he was thinking, I want that mountain. He never lost sight of that. But look at verse number 6. There's something here that shows his unfavorable circumstances. And then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenzite. Now notice here, He's pointing out his heritage, and he tells us his father is a Kenzanite. Now, that's no big deal to us today, right? But boy, that was a big deal in those days because the Kenzanites were descendants of Esau and not Jacob. And evidently his father had married into the tribe of Judah, and whenever Caleb was born, there's no reason to think this this. 
kid is ever going to amount to anything. He's never going to hold any important position here in, in, in the nation. He's a, he's a Esau, not Jacob. People would hold him at arm's length. They're not going to let him in. They're not going to do him any favors. By the way, that's not the only problem that that kid had. I'm talking about when he was a kid. He's 85 now. But back when he was a kid, what, he was in slavery. Born in slavery. But there was absolutely no reason to suspect that this guy would ever be able to do anything great. And yet, he became the prince of Judah's tribe. And the point is, folks, listen. Regardless of your circumstances, you can be a success in this world. No one has to be a failure. Success is discovering the will of God and doing it. That's it. And if you're a child of God... You can do that. And history is full of examples of men and women who against all odds succeeded in life. And there's no reason why you can't. So many times someone, especially in the day and age that we live in, and they come from homes where they've been mistreated, homes where they've been abused, homes that are, well, are not even homes. Kids born into this world don't even know who their daddy or is and how sad it is and so many times they start developing this inferiority complex that I'm I'm just no good, I'm worthless to everybody. You don't have to live your life that way. Jesus Christ made it possible to make you a somebody. He can take a no it's what he did with Moses. The first forty years of his life he was a somebody. In a sense, my daddy's just a king. But then he became a nobody. Forty long years, he's a nobody. He has nothing. And God spent the next 40 years showing the world he can take a nobody and make somebody out of him. And God can do that for you. He can do that for anyone here today. And that's what we see in his life here. Against all odds, unfavorable circumstances. And by the way, to some extent, the circumstances are always going to be unfavorable. You're not in heaven, you're on earth. There's always going to be something working against you. But thank God, he's for you. I notice in verse 7, 8, and 9, and I don't think I need to read it all again. But there we see his unwavering commitment. Caleb had proved himself trustworthy, chosen to be one of the twelve spies that was sent into Canaan. Whenever he returned, he comes back and, uh, oh, you know the story. Joshua and Caleb said, man, let's go. We can do this. God gave us that land. The other ten said, no, there's giants in that land. Caleb and Joshua, well, you know, it doesn't make any difference. We might be like grasshoppers, but we can take the land. God said so. And so here is Caleb all of these years after this, after being opposed by the status quo. It hurts whenever you feel like that the majority of others are against you. That must, that must have been a real blow to Joshua and, uh, and to Caleb. All ten voted, no, we don't go. Facing opposition. Usually whenever that happens, we become bitter, don't we? How dare they oppose this? And it's so amazing to me. Here is a man that continued to serve God even when the majority was against him. Not only did he continue to serve God, stay in the race and stay in the fight, but he did the right thing. He wholly followed the Lord, the Bible says. He did what was right. 
He never became angry. He, he didn't resign his position and say, well, if that's the way you're going to be, I'm out of here. I quit. You know, I, I'll just, I just quit. Caleb stayed there day after day, year after year after year, nearly 40 years later, before he could enter into the land. And all during that time, he remained steadfast. Well, if anybody knew what it was to live with disappointments, it was Caleb, but he never quit. He kept on serving God day after day after day, even though the circumstances were less than ideal. Wouldn't it be good if we were all that committed to the Lord? Yeah, there's going to be tough times. I sit here and right now there, I'm thinking of names of pastors that have resigned Walked off the job, left the church, all because a vote on some frivolous thing didn't go their way. You'd be surprised how many churches have split over little petty issues in the church. But it happens. But this isn't a little petty issue. This is a major issue. And I'll tell you, if you can tough it out, in a matter of this great importance, you can tough it out any time. There he is, still there. His unrelenting courage. Notice verse number 10. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. In verse 11. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. Now, I read that, and I'm 82. And here, and look, what he said might be true physically. I, I'm, I'm not doubting the Bible, but a lot of times when you get older, you think you can do some things you really can't do. Oh, I can reach, I can reach that. Yeah, you can get about halfway down there. But here he said, I'm as strong as I was back then. Uh, and re ready for war, ready to fight if need be. That's what he says here. It's very clear. Even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. I tell you, war is not a pleasant thought. There's bloodshed in war. There's suffering in war. He said, if that's what it takes, I'm ready. There's unrelenting courage he didn't let his old age rob him of his vision he was still excited about serving God after all of these years he's adventurous he's courageous even willing to fight as I said somebody might have wondered well what difference does it make at your age Caleb what man it's time you're 85 just kick back take it easy retire let the Younger generation take over. Now that's the way the natural mind thinks. But he wasn't made out of that kind of stuff. He wasn't going to quit. Not until I die. I made a commitment to God many years ago that I'd never retire. I might fall over dead up here one of these days. I might not be able to be here for a month or something but I promise you one thing as long as I'm able I'm going to be here unless you throw me out it's, it's so easy to let and I say old age it's not all about old age it's, it's about the health issues and things because sometimes we can get to the point that we feel like we're not any good for anything it's easy. The Satan will try to convince you of that. Why even try? You're past your prime. It's all downhill. Forget about it. I said, uh, it might have been the pastor's pen today, and we'll get that to you some other time, but you can still pray, can't you? As long as you've got breath. You, you don't have to have breath to pray. As long as you can pray, you can make a difference. But somebody says, what difference does it make to him? Why is this such a big deal? 
because it affected his posterity, his family. The future of his family depended upon his decision. Hebron, that's the land that was once possessed by Abraham. It's the most important parcel in all of the promised land. And he says, that's, that's what I want. That's what God promised me. That was Abraham's land. That was the land that was given to Caleb's children. It even became the land where there were the cities of refuge. If you know anything about that, you know someone that was guilty of manslaughter, they could flee there and get protection. He wanted that land because it served a definite purpose in the kingdom of God. And I ask you this morning, do you have, do you have a vision of what God wants you to do in your life? Do you have any hope of accomplishing that before you die? How committed are you to God's plan for your life? And it always pays to do what's right, even when nobody else appreciates it. I'm sure, I think, probably Joshua and Caleb probably had some chats all by themselves saying, I don't know why those guys voted against us. Uh, I I don't know why they did that. That's just so unfair. That's just so wrong of them and yet those guys stayed in the fight regardless of the challenge it makes a difference whether you give up or not because number one your children your grandchildren your great grandchildren God always rewards faithfulness look at verse number verse number 12 and we see his unfaltering confidence now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there and that the cities were great and fenced if so be that the Lord will be with me then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said Old age did not rob him of his confidence because his confidence never was in self. He attributed everything to God. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to fight. I'm willing to take by force if need be what God has given me. He said, if so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able. Let me tell you, if he's not with you, you're not able to do anything that's important at all in life. If you read over in chapter 15, you'll see that he did just that. And he can, listen, he can do the same thing for all of us. And this is so amazing when you consider the, his unlikely conquest as you read verse 13 and 14 and then you go over to chapter number 15. And the point is that what seemed impossible to God, to man was possible with God. We're talking about giants in the land. We're talking about walled cities. How do you get in? How do you fight people like that? It was an unlikely conquest. That's why the ten voted against them. They said, we're like, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. They'll squash us. It was unlikely, but it was not impossible because Caleb was basing everything not on self-confidence. He based everything on the promises that God had made. And whenever we look at this whole story, we have to conclude and say something about his unquestionable contribution that he made even to us today. Because somebody's saying, well, I wonder if it made any difference. So what? That's history. That all happened in the past. Yes, it made a difference. That was his family's inheritance. Place for the city of refuge. Later, by the way, it was David's royal palace. (laughs) You think that wasn't some value real estate? He knew how important that was. And I realize that we don't have the same struggles that Caleb faced. But we all have struggles, don't we? We have giants of a different kind. It 
sometimes we just give in and give up instead of going on. I want one last thing I want to mention, and that's his unmistakable challenge. I say that, I use that word challenge because I want this and each and every one of us to consider Caleb's story in a personal way. He based everything he did on God's promises. Is that the way you're living, by the way? Do you base all your behavior on things that God has promised? That's the way we ought to live. That's the reason I know that I'm a child of God. Because I based it all on God's promise. I based on how I feel. Some days you might not feel like you're going to heaven, but you have God's promise that you have eternal life and He'll never leave you, He'll never forsake you. You have that promise. You say, yeah, but I'm weak. Yes, but you have that promise that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You say, yeah, but I'm strong, but I'm poor. Yeah, well, but my God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches in glory. You see, there's a promise for every problem that you have in your life. And this becomes a challenge to you and I whenever we realize that these things, as Paul said, were written for Ireland and our admonition is for, for us to be instructed, for us not just to have a class out of history, but for us to find principles that we apply to our own life. And as Peter said, God has given us exceeding great and precious promises. And sadly, most Christians are living beneath their privileges as a child of God. They're robbing themselves of blessings that could have been theirs. And I really hope this morning that you want better for yourself than that. Because God has better. We've all got a mountain of some kind. Have you ever thought about what God wants you to have? For Caleb, it was that mountain. And Caleb said, that's what I want. I want that mountain. Let me make some suggestions based on what God has said about what God wants for you. He speaks about a love that passeth knowledge. A love that never fails. You have read that, right? You do know that's in the Bible, right? That's what God wants for you. He doesn't want any of us to live in bitterness and with malice. A love that passeth knowledge. That's, the, that's the Christian love. The question is, do, do, you, have, do you have that are you still facing the challenge of, of getting that mountain because of the lack of love in your life? Then the Bible speaks about joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. That's what God doesn't want gloom and despair for you. He said, I want you to have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Why? The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what God wants for you. And the strange thing is, we sometimes act like, oh, we've lost our joy, and that's no big deal. You know, one week we shout our hair down and waving our hankies in the air, and boy, having a hallelujah hold down. Oh, we love the Lord so much, and the very next minute, all of a sudden, we're down in the dumps. You say, oh, yeah, but preacher, don't you understand? Things change. I, oh, I understand. I'm not as young as I used to be. I don't feel like I, I see my wife not being able to walk in four years and laying on sleeping on the couch every night and every all day long and living there. Yeah, I, yeah, I understand. Let me tell you something. The Lord said what? Through Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And your cancer, your heart trouble, your bankruptcy... Any problem you've got should never, ever rob you of your joy in the Lord. You say, well, I, well, I don't understand that. Well, you, you need to. You'll never fully understand it. 
But there shouldn't be anything take away your joy from the Lord, even when you're in the fire, even when you're in the fight. And week after week, people that lost their joy six months or a year ago, and people that have been living in darkness and gloom, they'll walk out those doors acting like there's nothing wrong with me. You lost your joy. That is your strength. And you're going to out there into a world of temptation and expect to, expect to survive. And you won't. You give up on what God wants you to do because you lost your joy. It don't make you happy anymore. It's not about you. It's about God. He wants you to have a love that passeth knowledge, joy unspeakable and full of glory, and a peace that passeth all understanding. God doesn't want us to live in turmoil and doubt. He tells us, I want you to have a peace that passeth all understanding. He didn't say, I want you to have peace, you know, whenever you, whenever you get a raise, or I don't want you to have peace whenever you, everything's going your way. He expects us to have that peace. You say, yeah, but preacher, I, if you knew that my problems, you'd understand. No, your problems doesn't matter. I mean, yes, they matter in the sense that we're concerned about people with problems. But that doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you ought to have peace that passes understanding in your heart. It ought to be there regardless of the circumstances. That peace of God, you say, well, how is that possible? Because Jesus said, I give you what? My peace. You see, it's His peace. I give you my peace, not the peace the world gives. See, Jesus got something a whole lot better than anything the world can give you. I give you my peace. And whether you believe it or not, whatever you're going through in life, at the same time, you can have a tear in your eye and be brokenhearted, grieving over the loss of a loved one, and yet have some deep settled peace in your heart that passes all understanding. You didn't think you could do it, but there you are going through it. There's other mountains. He wants us to have faith, faith that never fails, a hope that is steadfast and sure, wisdom that is from above. That's just a short list of the things that God want you, things God's promised that you can have. And I hope you'll leave here today feeling like Caleb, that you'll scotch your feet and say, by the grace of God, I want what God wants for me. Why, why would anyone not want what God wants? If God's will is always right, always best, and always the safest, why wouldn't we want that for ourselves? You know, the Bible speaks about putting off, the, talking to Christians, put off the old man and put on the new. Whenever he makes that statement, what Paul is saying is the responsibility is squarely on your shoulders. If you are a child of God, there's never an excuse for failure in your life. I'm a child of God. There's no excuse for my failures. Even when I fail, it's all my fault. He says, put off that old nature, those vestiges of the fleshly carnal nature that you lived by before you were saved, and put on the new man, that new man which is what? Christ. That's a big responsibility. And whenever we claim to be a child of God, we need to understand we have a huge responsibility. Only one thing. There's mountains that God has promised to you. The love, the joy, the peace. Might be a mountain of a different sort. But you have a responsibility in that. Somebody said, you know, God feeds the, the little birds, but he doesn't throw the worm in the nest. 
Caleb could have sat there and said, well, I know God, God failed. If God wants me to have it, why, well, he'll, they'll just turn it over to me. No, we have a responsibility. And if you want that mountain in your life, your marriage mended, whatever your problem is, whatever your need is, it boils down to this. We have to trust and obey. Trust and obey. Because where there's faith, there will always be obedience. And when we trust God and obey God, just as Caleb did, we can, we can expect the very best that God has for us. As one of your pastors, that's what I want for you. Those of you that are older, you remember back years ago whenever we used to have our vision retreat. Every year we had a vision retreat. Went up on Quantum Lakes, reserved that place. We didn't go up there to fish. We went up there and held a vision retreat. What wonderful times we had. Meeting together, talking about God, helping us to understand and how we can achieve our purpose for doing the will of God. And sometimes as yes, churches, we, we lose that vision. And maybe as a Christian, you've lost the vision of what God wants you to be and what God wants you to do. And worst of all, you might be here today and you, you, you don't even have a relationship with God. Oh, you might have a family Bible that's handed down through the generations in your house, but... You've never really been born again. You never trusted Christ as your Savior. And you're just one heartbeat. It's going to be blunt, but I'm telling you the truth. You're just one heartbeat, one step away from a devil's hell if you die without Christ. And that doesn't have to happen to anyone. Jesus suffered, bled, and died on that old rugged cross, and His blood was shed. And He did it all for you, folks. He paid your sin debt. He took your place. He became the sacrifice, the substitute for you. And you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is your Father and heaven is your home if you'll trust Him. And I kind of think sometimes that, you know, we, uh, we expect unsaved people to respond I think sometimes they'd be more likely to respond if they, if they saw us as Christians more responsive to the needs in our life. God has that mountain for you. Love without knowledge. You, you could never have that kind of love on your own. That's a mountain too big for you. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. I don't care how hard you try. You can never do that on your own. But all of those things are things that God says, this is what I want for you. I'll give you this. And the question today is, how bad do you want that mountain? How bad do you want what God has for you? There it is. Just faith and obedience. Just trust and obey. Lord, I'm going to claim my inheritance today. Would you do that? Let's all stand with David. You'll come and the musicians and... Brother Kenneth will be here at the front to receive you. And you don't even have to say anything to Brother Kenneth or me or anyone else. It might be that you just want to come this morning and kneel in prayer and say, I've been living without my mountain too long. The love and the joy and the peace and all of those good things I could have had, should have had. I've been doing without and no more. With God's help, I'm going to claim that mountain in my life today. While we sing, you come. Oh, to Jesus come.